Hi there, and welcome to Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley. Um, hey, Dr. Tolley. Hey, Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year to you, too. Yes, it was Christmas the last time we were here. <gasps> was it really? Wow. Yes. Can you believe it? And it's no. already Christmas again. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you for joining us again. Um, yeah, hopefully let's let's get everyone on a good start for the new year with uh, with with their bird's health. It's uh, it's always you know I I I read that like January I could be wrong about the exact date but like January twentieth is about the day where most people um, drop off on their New Year's resolutions. Second Friday in in January. Oh, you, second, is that well, second you know two weeks in January, second Friday I think, and it's called Quitters Day. Ah. So you can look it up, Quitters Day. <laughs> is that something that you know because of personal experience <laughs> uh n well not necessarily not necessarily but i think it's kind of uh an interesting concept there there's a day for just about everything but uh, <laughs> but i wonder yeah. who who designated that and why you know i'm, I guess. I'm sure there's some scientific uh, survey <laughs> yeah. behind that um yeah, you know the the well prior to COVID, I'm sure the gym, you know, the gyms were packed, and then they probably noticed that hey, second Friday in January, it's not so packed. So, yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, <laughs> all right, well, well, welcome back. Um, if you're just joining us, you were with the Ask the Vet with Dr. Tom Tolley. Um, and before we get into things, just a reminder that if you do have a question uh, for Dr. Tolley, to use the Q and A button and not the chat feature. So then we can capture the question um, and get to it easier and also get you an answer easier. If we don't get to it uh, verbally today, we can email you an answer. So with all that said, um, let's see. Um, well, Dr. Tolley, we were just prior to the hidden broadcast, we, you, you had mentioned something about finches. So why don't we start off with that? Um, yes, well, uh, you know, one of the, the, I guess one of the, the points that I try to to and, and to, to discuss and, and try to get owners uh, comfortable with um, is that I, I really like uh, owners that have uh, that are informed. Uh, I like owners that are educated and, and, and really encourage uh, owners to to know more about uh, their their birds and and also, uh, what's involved in, in raising and, and providing the best environment for those birds to live in. And, and, and so uh, doing uh, uh, the research and finding the information, of course, it's, it's very, very easy to do uh, with the internet. And there is a wealth of information when you put anything in. How many hits do you get as far as uh, uh, with your keywords? You know, a million hits <laughs> on on Google, right? And so, of course, the more the more um, I guess uh, correlated uh, uh, hits are at the beginning uh, for what your keywords are. But uh, finding out and learning nutrition the care for the birds, what to look for, uh, over and above uh, what your, your, your veterinarian uh, can, can uh, provide in the time that you're with them is always helpful because knowing what is normal versus abnormal <clears throat> is, is, is key to getting ahead of any type of uh, uh, condition that may be uh, an illness. <clears throat> Or, or problematic. And, and so that's always what I encourage uh, owners to do. And, and, and I think that in the end, you're going to be, uh, you'll get much more out of the, uh, your, your, your interaction with your, your bird than if you, you didn't do that. And, 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 and I say that in, in the sense that uh, just like <clears throat> Dr. Irene Pepperberg, you know, with Alex the African Gray, uh, in, in, she, in, in, in the conclusion of the studies, uh, <clears throat> were kind of like, were all, are all, all African Grays like Alex? And, and, and so, in, 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 in what, what her, her statements were, and, and the basis is that, <clears throat> uh, and, and what she's, uh, come to find out that, that it, each one's individual, just like we are. 
Um, but uh, it, 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 in many cases and in most cases, if not all cases, that you can enhance the ability of the bird to, to, to be uh, you know, more interactive, to, to, to reach its potential if you encourage that in a favorable way. And so by being informed on what to do to be as far as nutrition and as far as it, it means the environment, the stimulating environment that it's in, you can get in, and have your bird reach that potential. With that said, <clears throat> there's also the, the issue of, well, <clears throat> if there's something wrong with the bird, uh, let me go online and see what I can do to fix it. <clears throat> And we all do that. Oh, I've got a cut. You don't go to a physician, or as they call them now, providers, and get a, uh, say, well, I've got a, a cut, you know, uh, what do I do? <clears throat> well, you, you know, you, of course, at, at home will put some Neosporin and a Band-Aid on it or something like that. But if, if uh, there is a, a kind of a serious issue or something like that, that you're not aware of, <clears throat> then, well, let me see what's going on and try to interpret what's going on with my bird and then treat it by what's uh, with on the, the that you, you get through your resources. <clears throat> and, and, and one of the issues that you have with this is that um, what, what are you treating and are you treating it appropriately? And I always, I always say, what's the goal of having, having birds uh, in, 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 a, in one or, or many? <clears throat> you don't want to treat them with anything. No different than what we do as far as, uh, as, far as we wake up in the morning, well, did you have your antibiotic? Did you have your antiviral medication? Oh, well, maybe I'll get a fungus today, so I'm going to take that too. And so you take all these medications every day so you don't get it, and, but you're, you're fine, but we're just going to protect. What you have to remember about any type of medications, <clears throat> and you can look online, I mean, you can look on the, uh, the network television, commercials. How many medications are advertised on network television yeah. in prime time? there's a medication for everything. Now, <clears throat> each one of those medications, they are advertising to treat one specific illness or one specific problem. But at the end of those commercials, what are the side effects? A lot. A list that long. And so, and some of them are pretty dire uh, side effects. <clears throat> so you go like, well, why would somebody take that medication if there's so many side effects? And that's for any medication you look at. You could go to the physician's test reference that gives all of the therapeutics that are given to humans. And that, if it's published, it's about that thick. <clears throat> about 90% of that side effects and only 10% are the good effects just like chemotherapy and cancer patients. You're not saying that there's some serious side effects with chemotherapy? Why would anybody take that? Because <clears throat> the good outweighs the bad. And so it, with so many side effects and medication, you don't wanna just give medication just to prevent things. You wanna get your birds or bird healthy and, and, not, and where would they be exposed to these organisms if you have a, a closed or the birds inside or whatever? It's not gonna get exposed to any. So you don't need to keep treating them because they're not exposed to anything if they are. And again, we're saying the bird looks healthy. <clears throat> so treating them, your, the possibility of the side, the good is not outweighing the bad. When we prescribe medications, we know the side effects and we know <clears throat> that the good on those medications is outweighing the potential bad. So 
always the goal is to maintain a healthy uh, 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 one bird or an aviary. And your goal is to not treat with anything and just provide the nutrition and environment that's going to uh, have those birds reach their potential. So I just wanted to uh, keep that in mind because there's going to be a lot, there, there is a lot of information out there and just treating to treat yeah. is, we wouldn't do it to ourselves. I mean, there's, there, there's, there's people that don't want to take, you know, we'll get a vaccine to protect themselves. That's their, 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 their opinion. But, but, but yet somebody is going to just treat birds just to treat them when there's no evidence that they even have this, this problem. So uh, the, 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 the key, clean birds, no treatments if, if, uh, and treat only if needed. So that's what we'll, we'll start with. <clears throat> That'll be our, um, that's our, our, to start the new year. There you go, right there. Um, yeah. <laughs> preventive medicine and work with your vet and all that good stuff too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. The, the new year is to have good, healthy, happy birds that live a long time. That's our, our goal. You know, there we go. On that. Yeah. There we go. All right. Um, so we got, that was a good intro. Um, and we've got our first uh, question of the day from Denise. And she asks, uh, why are my male birds now biting and dive bombing after being nice? Uh, what, you know, what I'm going to need is kind of what, what is the, um, <clears throat> what kind of birds are we talking about here? Okay. Yeah, you, know, um, you know, we're going to need to know a little more bit info. more. Okay. All right, Denise, if you can give us some more info on that, we'll. Uh... And, and, and who are they dive bombing? <laughs> is it is it the the questioner? Are they dive bomb? Are they flying around and like woo? You know, and I mean that's possible. That's possible. But I want to yeah. you know make sure <laughs> you know. She may be, she may have food in her hand that they want, or she may, uh, they just may yeah. want to get her away from what they're doing. I don't know. But and I imagine there'd be a difference between like Amazon's dive bombing you versus like Finch's dive bombing you. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Very much so. Very much All right. so. Well, we'll get some more uh, detail on that one. Um, yeah, yeah. Here we go. Here we go. We got one from Tony. Um, uh, okay, this is from Lynn and Tony Gardner in the UK. So thank you for joining us. Mm -hmm. um, we have a 12 week old cockatiel who is doing really well, although we would like to ask why he sometimes appears to eat his poop. Why he sometimes appears to eat his poop. Oh, <clears throat> yeah, a 12 week old, a 12 week old cockatiel. Yes. Okay, okay. Um, uh, again, it, it, um, mm, uh, three, three months of age, um, you're, you're, you're having a, a, um, a bird that is, is, uh, obviously, uh, young and in, in, in a situation of, of exploration. And this is the 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 best uh, um, and, and the most to me <clears throat> uh, thoughtful answer that I can provide there. Um, and, and and this is also considering that the bird is um, getting a good diet. And so I, I would say it's getting a complete diet because um, we call it pica, and and that's almost uh, where. The, the animal will uh, eat, in this case, a bird, <clears throat> say like a cuddle bone. They don't know why they want to eat a cuddle bone, but uh, there's a physiologic need for calcium. So they'll eat a cuddle bone or mineral block when they're uh, laying eggs or not, uh, because uh, male birds will eat it too when they need the calcium supplementation, which is what a cuddle bone or a mineral block provides. But um, so, so birds can uh, eat something that's not their normal diet 
um, <clears throat> that is it, that they have a physiologic desire to, to eat. Um, but <clears throat> the the uh, the situation here is that you have a normal uh, you have a good diet, a good good uh, young bird diet. And, and, and what will happen at this point, especially as they're going from uh, more of a, a hand feeding or, or also when they're going from a parent raise, that they're exploring. It's an exploration situation. And so, of course, um, the, the, uh, the, the fecal materials down there and that they'll just, they will do that as a, um, as a means to explore and 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 that's why they they'll they'll uh, sometimes eat it or just appear to be eating it uh, because it's something that's that's interesting to them um, and and so other animals will will do this but uh, for the most part that's a, kind of a behavior uh, that's associated with a a younger, a younger bird and, and they'll grow out of it. Are there any medical concerns if from them digesting it? Uh, uh, theoretically, <clears throat> theoretically not. Um, and you say, well, what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> theoretically. Uh, and so uh, for the most part, uh, the, the, the stool will have um, flora that is was in the GI tract. And if there's no pathogenic flora or no parasites within that GI tract uh, that the bird can kind of reinfect itself mm -hmm. or increase the amount of pathogenic organisms in its GI tract, then it's, it's probably not going to, it, it, it's, it's likely not gonna be any any, any problem um, uh, with just the, the intermittent um, tasting of uh, corporophagy or eating of fecal word. material, yeah. oh, as opposed to geophagy, which is eating dirt. Ah, birds, yeah. That's you know, cool. so we learn all types of things on, on Ask the Vet, right? But yeah. anyway, good question. Thank you very much. And, and I have another follow-up question to that now, fascinated by us. What if you have more than one bird and a bird is eating fecal matter uh, that's not theirs? Is that more of an issue? I mean, I imagine frequent cage liner cleanings and stuff would help with this, but um, like if you had say like a couple birds in the cage together or... or... Uh, no, I, I think that the, uh, the um, the, the issue on, on that would be, be very similar, Laura. Okay. I think that it would be if the bird is not, um, doesn't have any pathogens or bad back, uh, microorganisms or, or parasites that it, it probably would be a very similar GI floor if they're in the same cage. Now, if this is an older bird or, <clears throat> or it's, it's, it's really, kind of uh, more than just intermittent as far as this this behavior is concerned then I would I would look at, at the nutritional composition of the feed because there's possibly something within the feed that or something that's missing with the uh, the ingredients in the feed okay okay and then Cindy has a kind of a question and a comment about sugar in, in diets um, so regarding, uh, she says, regarding nutrition um, to discuss sugar, I know it's not good for birds, but many of the diets are made with sugar. Um, and it, she finds that quite frustrating. Do you have any comment on, on that? Uh, I, I, I think that there, there uh, it, it, it's, the comment is that the amount of, of uh, sugar in the diets uh, that that I'm aware of, and the diets that that I'm um, familiar with, that it's not of a significant amount to cause any any health issues, and I haven't really noted any health issues as it relates to the diets that are fed 
that that contain the sugar um, that uh, you know that that that's that's not attributed to possible um, uh, overfeeding or 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 adding other other uh, dietary um, uh, offerings uh, that that are outside of what the bird should normally um, eat. If you if you follow me, not if it, meaning that the diets that are made for birds, the sugar, I do not believe that contents in there is problematic as it relates to any health issues that that I'm I'm aware of or have been published, um, and and uh, the and, and that if you feed the bird uh, the recommended um, diets. Uh, for birds that are manufactured for birds, eat those that contain sugar, uh, because most of them, as she's she's right, in some form or fashion, um, mm -hmm. that they, um, and I think uh, that it's not going to be high on the ingredient list. I'll always remember the most, the most, um, the, the 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 ingredient that has the, is the highest percentage within that. That, that diet is going to be at the top. The one at the lowest percentage is going to be at the very bottom. And I think most of the sugar that uh, would be incorporated <clears throat> that's not within the kind of part of an ingredient that is going to be very low. And um, so if you, in feeding those diets, I, I think in the proper manner, the birds will be, be fine. So it's not it's not a big concern of mine, and it's not something that that I I talk to to my bird owners about. Okay, um, and then we have a question um, uh, about my. Uh, okay, here's a question: um, Two year old cockatiel uh, crop stagnation has continued for a long time. He is tube fed um, his omnivores by washing them with fresh uh, saline three times daily. What what do you like? What kind of is this the correct treatment? What what kind of treatment do you recommend? Um, is this a, uh, a cockatoo? Cockatiel. Not cockatiel. A cockatiel. Cockatiel with with a crop uh, stagnation. Crop crop stagnation. It's also also uh, can be uh, described as crop stasis. Uh, also can lead to a sour crop because crop stagnation. Or if the crop is not moving, and and usually my my thoughts when you go into this is that the bird um, is fed or eats, um, and then what happens is that the food really just sits in the crop, and it doesn't through normal peristaltic action go from the crop to the to the, the proventriculus or the stomach, and. And if that occurs, it, 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 it provides an environment that, that actually promotes uh, candida, uh, which is a yeast growth, and also can promote the, the, the growth of pathogenic bacteria. So in, in the pathogenic bacteria could have been there, what came first, the crops, crop stasis or the pathogenic bacteria? Um, that caused an ingluvitis, which an ingluvitis is, is just a crop inflammation. The ingluvies is the crop. Um, and so uh, it can cause an inflammation that results in crop stasis. But nonetheless, the sour crop is when you have somewhat of a fermentation occur within that crop. And you can smell that um, in, when the bird breathes and you have that coming from the digestive system. That is, is not good. Um, and this is something that if you do have an abnormal odor coming from your bird's um, beak, um, that, that could be an indication of some type of a crop infection, uh, even if you don't have crop stasis, uh, because you shouldn't have really any, any uh, really uh, smell that is um, not uh, an unpleasant smell coming from a bird's beak. Um, 
but that's why that's how the crop sour crop uh, crop stasis and and so with that and knowing what is the possibility of causing that is the the fact that you is is trying to treat that and and usually this is a, uh, due to a pathogenic bacteria or an and and maybe a secondary overgrowth of uh, say like a candida or a yeast um, uh, infection. And so that has to be treated specifically. And, and, and what's interesting is that, uh, that you can treat it with a, a common back, uh, antibiotic um, and uh, a broad spectrum, we call it broad spectrum, uh, treat it with um, uh, nystatin is another drug uh, that we, we use for candida, but uh, sometimes you don't have the candida. And so how to diagnose this is to, to you can do cytology, which is get a swab and put it down the, the, <clears throat> the bird's beak into the crop, put it on a slide, and you can look and see these organisms. Um, and can see if you have an, uh, oh, wow, look at all of these yeasts, you know, and it's, it's, there's, there's, there's a, a bunch of them. Uh, and I don't know what the numeral uh, terminology of a bunch is, but it's a lot. <laughs> yeah. <More than> three. <laughs> so, so that needs to be treated. And, and, and so, and then also those are usually secondary to bacterial infections. Now, what we found is that on some of these crop infections that cause this distension and this, this crop not moving is that the bacteria in there can be resistant to a, a, a number of common antibiotics um, or, or sensitive. We just don't know. We, we don't know what those bacteria are. are, um, are. And that's why you uh, culture and sensitivity is always um, very, um, very good at trying to identify the underlying cause of this. And if you don't treat those, those, um, those, uh, that bacteria, the bacteria that are causing this problem with the appropriate um, medication, then this problem will just will continue. And so what, what, what the uh, person that's, that sent the question is asking, is this the proper treatment? Well, you do, do need to clean the crop out and, and, and provide the, um, <clears throat> um, uh, you know, the, provide the underlying environment for treatment uh, as, as he's mentioning, but that alone if a bacteria or yeast are causing this, it's not going to resolve the problem. Uh, not until you treat it with the appropriate medication. Um, and, and again, it depends on what you find uh, with this. So, so that's in, in, in normal situation, that's the most common uh, cause of um, this, this, this problem. Yeah. Is it is it normal or not? Or is it is it? Um, they mentioned about tube feeding. Is that something that you would do with a, a condition like this? Typically? Well, uh, you, you, the the um, the issue with the with the uh, the gavage tube, if you you feed it, uh, a couple of couple of things that that sometimes is helpful in in trying to uh, actually. <clears throat> remove the crop contents that are, that have really uh, fermented in there. And so you want, you know, by doing that, you remove the crop contents that are, that are like the fermented and, and, and then what you do is clean that out. You okay. can kind of flush that a little bit. And so you empty the crop and then, and then you can provide some medication and then if the bird <clears throat> is not um, uh, eating uh, on that, you know, and, and you may want to, this is one of the times when you may look at providing 
and a smaller dose because you want to keep giving that bird, you want the bird to, to have crop function and to gain energy and to provide something like the Emeraid where you have the <clears throat> nutritional supplementation that's a little bit easier to digest at a, at a smaller volume and you can work up to uh, its, its regular diet as the healing process occurs. So the, the, the uh, clean, uh, kind of flushing the crop, treating the crop with the tube is going to be and kind of ensure that you are actually getting and doing what you need to within the crop. Now, I'm, uh, as I say this, you want to be very um, uh, comfortable with doing that and being in uh, and, and knowing what the condition of your, your, the bird you're treating is, because this can be stressful. And so um, depending on, on how severe the condition is and what the general condition of the bird is, you want to be, you don't want to stress the bird to where it would be life-threatening to do something like this. So you may have to do this more in, in, in steps as the bird recovers. Okay, thank you for does that. that, uh, that uh, yeah, answer my question. <laughs> um, so our next question is actually, it's an interesting one from Linda. It's kind of a twist on the typical Lupron question we get. This one involves, um, can you advise on how Lupron injections work for male birds and any risks involved? There's not much in, um, out there uh, for this. It's mostly info that addresses female birds. Are there any natural substitutions for Lupron? So. Uh, well, as far as uh, Lupron and, and what we use is um, uh, commonly, uh, although they do make a higher uh, milligram implant, we use the Deslorelin implants um, in, in, in the birds, primarily, primarily for uh, birds that are uh, having excessive egg laying. Mm -hmm. and, and so, this is something that we will we will use um, in the bird uh, as a subcutaneous implant, um, and it affects the the, the hormonal um, I guess effect uh, on the the ovaries to to prevent uh, to reduce the chance of of ovulation or laying eggs uh, as and so that's what that's what it is. That's what the implant does. So um, if if we were looking at putting this into a male bird, uh, you would be looking at the hormonal effects, uh, reducing the amount of uh, hormone and activity, uh, testicular activity, uh, on that, um, and in in reducing the, the the hormones that would have have uh, effects there, um, adverse effects that you didn't want. And you're saying, well, what, what could that be? What could that be? Maybe it's an aggressive bird. And one thing that I would say is that I don't, we don't see as many as we used to. Um, and, and we would see over, over time, we would see the very aggressive I'd call him the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde, Amazon parrot, where it was, it was very nice and mm -hmm. fun and friendly for nine months out of the year. And then starting in March or April through June, it would just all of a sudden become just a, an aggressive and just a, a hormonally influenced bird uh, and, 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 uh, and bite and do things that just it didn't do for the rest of the year. Uh, and so we don't see many, but in, in those type cases, it would be interesting to see what uh, effect that would have on that Amazon behavior if we put an implant in, say, in February and had it go through that whole whole period of March, April, May into June, just to see if we could get a reduction in aggressive behavior. Now here at LSU, we, we have had, uh, I know we have, uh, we have um, uh, a raptor, well, we have a raptor unit, we have resident raptors, and we had 
one that was somewhat uh, aggressive um, at, at, at times. And uh, we used the implant for that bird and it seemed to, to reduce that bird's aggressive behavior. Otherwise did, did well. So that would be possibly one, one example of how to use that in a, in a male bird. And another would be uh, a cockatoo. Uh, we have cockatoos that uh, these are behavior issues and we try to encourage owners not to become too interactive with their birds to the point of um, mating behavior. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and so uh, it's not to discourage interaction, but uh, really stimulating petting and things of this nature um, uh, to the point of even masturbation. And that is something that is not uncommon at all. And what this leads to is cloacal prolapse. And this cloacal prolapse is something that is very difficult to get the genie back into the bottle or Pandora back into the box. You just, it's just very difficult to do. So you never really want this to occur, especially if it's hormonally induced or that's the best answer for the, the reason. And we have this in female birds and we have it in males. And, and we have uh, utilize the implant to try to reduce the, the hormonal effects that may, may lead to a continuation of this problem. Um, but unfortunately, the implants aren't what I would call cheap, okay? And, it, and so you say, well, what, what's the cost? Well, 200 to $300 or something in that U.S. And, and so, and, and when you do it, and when, well, when you do it, when you place the implant into the bird, you're really not sure how effective it's going to be. I can't say, well, Dr. Tully, you know, you just, you know, put this implant into the bird and, you know, is it going to last six months and one day or 12 months and three days? We have no clue. It could last no day. It, and, and, and it could last two years. That is because there is some, there's some research, even on female birds, on how effective these implants are. Mm -hmm. But we just don't know how long that they will be effective for. And in one bird of the same species, it may be effective for this long, or we may see, and then we may see the same, same species of bird but a different patient and it only may be effective for this long. So it's really a, an unknown how effective the Lupron implants will be either for birds that are uh, males that you may use it on for aggressive behavior or for cloacal prolapse or for female birds to stop laying. Now I can say that for you know, the, the birds, the more experience you have and utilizing them for different species, and we utilize them for, for cockatiels, in, in, uh, you know, quite often we, uh, uh, collectives, parrots, uh, we have used, and, and it's usually like, say, um, you know, you know, what I always tell the owners are, is that, well, what you, you know, we'll see how well it works. We don't know how long it'll last, but when you start seeing any type or a, a hit of reproductive activity, bring the bird in for another implant, if that's the, the path they've taken. So that's the best I can, I can say with the implants, because, you know, that's, that's, that's all, all we know and each species and each individual is, is a little different. And um, they do have an effect, but um, sometimes it's just not as much as we want. So hopefully that answers just implants on males and females. Okay, and just uh, before we get to the next question, I just gonna uh, tell everyone a reminder when that next, next Friday, 
and we're going to be with Dr. Lam, and, and that whole uh, webinar topic is going to be uh, love is, is love is in the air. Am I sending uh, my parrot the wrong signal? So kind of going about um, kind of addressing you know uh, accidentally uh, hormonally stimulating your birds. So that should be covered next Friday in depth. So well, very, I recommend it highly. No, okay. well, not you know, not yeah. not uh, the the webinar for sure. Webinar. <laughs> <laughs> Let's clarify that. Okay, <laughs> all right. So uh, moving on, our next question is from uh, Eileen. Um, I have been watching a friend's birds and have a concern. The smallest cockatiel is being treated for inflamed nares and gets medicine twice a day. Lately, his partner, who is a 25-year-old male cockatiel, has been exhibiting open mouth breathing. Um, I took them to the vet, but nothing was found. The condo is very warm, so I got a humidifier for the breathing. Could the warmth cause the bird to open mouth breathe, or could he be looking for attention? What a great bird watcher you are, uh, by the way, Eileen. So, all right, Dr. Polly, let's see what we Well, I, I, I would say, is a 25-year-old cockatiel? Did she say uh, that? So yeah, it looks like, so there are more, there's two birds at least. One's a, a, the smallest cockatiel is being treated for inflamed nares. Um, and then there's a, also his partner is a 25 year old male cockatiel who is now having uh, open mouth breathing. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah, 25 years old, that's like, a, um, you know, over a hundred year old human. I mean, that's a, that's a very, very old cockatiel. But as my grandmother said, don't tell me about how old I am. Tell me what's wrong with me and get me well. Uh, so, so with that in mind, the open mouth breathing can definitely be associated with, with heat in birds. And it's not conducive to the birds living that long. So, so but it, 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 when we're talking about, um, you know, I would hope that, you know, in, under most circumstances, when you have a, a, uh, the, the, the general ambient temperature within the environment, uh, say is in the, the seventies, uh, in, in most cases, I would say low seventies or, you know, <clears throat> that that's going to be fine for the bird. Um, the inflamed nares in that one bird uh, doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the condition that the other bird has. Um, uh, open, open mouth breathing and if, and if the, the tail, uh, when they're really looking, when a bird's really looking to get, um, uh, really looking to get um, air in, in, into its body, um, mm -hmm they don't have a diaphragm. I think we've talked about this. They don't have a diaphragm. So they have to use their abdominal muscles and their, their rib muscles. And, and, and so under normal circumstances, their tails like this. And then if they have to breathe more, their tail is bobbing. It's called the tail bobbing. Mm -hmm. And so, because they're, <sighs> and so to do that, that's to get more air into their lungs. And uh, so, so with the open mouth breathing, there's a couple of issues that can occur, and this has happened in, in cockatiels. There could be something in the in the the trachea. There could be a block, some a partial blockage in the trachea that's causing it. I need to to get air in there. Uh, of course, there could be something uh, that's uh, affecting in uh, the air sacs or lungs. There could be a lower respiratory condition. So either, either blockage or a, a partial. Now partial because, the, uh, of course, if you had complete occlusion of the trachea, we wouldn't be talking about this question or discussing it. But a partial blockage um, and or a lower respiratory um uh, condition uh, that's involving the lungs or air sacs. Also, when you have this, and when we say involving the lungs or air sacs, that when, when you have uh, a mass, okay, a mass, uh, it could be fluid, it could be a tumor, uh, an enlarged organ, uh, liver, uh, that's putting pressure on the air sacs or reducing the uh, air capacity within the body that the, the 
respiratory system of the bird is not functioning uh, 100%. So it's reduced, the, the capacity is reduced. So it needs to try to, to get more air into the, the body uh, and through the lungs. And so that will cause the bird to, to open mouth breathe. So those are all possibilities. Uh, it could relate to something that's not even related to the, to the respiratory system, but having an effect on the respiratory system to do this. So this is all what would be, would be possible with the bird with the open mouth breathing. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and so the question was, was reducing heat, would that help? Yeah, that, that, I mean, if it was you know, too warm, that would help. Also, sometimes we get respiratory inflammation or irritation due to um, uh, like air fresheners. Um, and, and I'm gonna mention the, the products, the Glade products were the ones, the plug-in air fresheners. Mm -hmm. We had a cockatiel that would come in that was in respiratory distress because it had one of the plug-in air fresheners um, and we'd get it better and then send it home, it'd get worse, come back in, till we figured out it was the air freshener that they had in the, in the apartment there. Oh. Yeah, so, so, yeah. So kind of take a look at the environment too when you're. Yeah, oh yeah. Wow, okay. Um, uh, Stephanie asks, what do you think of an all fresh diet? Can it be done if you're feeding a whole chop that contains many ingredients and variations such as vegetables, grains, legumes, seeds, herbs, flowers, et cetera? Well, the, the, the issue is, is to make sure if, you, if anybody ever does any of that, to, to make sure that they have all of the vitamins and minerals that are required um, and that the bird eats all of those, the, the diet there. The problem that you have when you when you provide a lot of different varieties of, of food uh, over and above a single um, uh, main primary diet is that the bird's gonna only eat what it wants to eat. Similar to if you provide just a seed diet alone um, that it'll, and you change the seed out daily, then all it's going to eat are the seeds it likes. So it'll be on a mono diet, whatever that is. Uh, you feed a, a hyacinth macaw, uh, a, a, a cornucopia of food, okay? Um, and, 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 and you give it macadamia nuts and you do this every day. For the most part, all that hyacinth's gonna do is eat the, the macadamia nuts but you are providing a, a variety. So you have to be very careful when you make your own diets for the birds because are they getting uh, all, of their, all of their vitamins? Are they getting all of the minerals? Are they only eating one thing? And, you have, and if you make a fresh diet, it has to be fresh every day. Or, I mean, they go, you know, this, it degrades very quickly and spoils. So it, it's a, it is a uh, very challenging um, and, and laborious, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, procedure uh, to, tr to do that. Okay. Um, and then uh, Nancy asks uh, about nair flushing. Will, nair, will the nair return to normal size after a huge chunk of material was flushed? Uh, it was very swollen before, and after seven days, it's still ugly. <laughs> yeah, um, well, it, it will take a, a, a while to, to remodel, and I'm not sure what type of bird this is, but African greys can get what we call granulomas in the nares, and, and it can disfigure uh, the, the nares. And, and, and there's a, a term in, in, in swine and in, 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 uh, with pig medicine called atrophic rhinitis, where uh, you get a, a, a distortion of the, the, the kind of the sinuses uh, 
due to a um, uh, inflammation and an, an inflammation caused by infection. And so it can get distorted. And, and that term was uh, somewhat uh, adapted to, to birds where these grays would have granulomas and other birds too, but primarily in grays and they would get like something of a hard abscess in the, in the nares and the nasal opening and you remove it, but it, it, it changes the, the physical appearance of the, of the uh, nares and it will remodel a little bit, but it'll never go back to normal. And I'm not sure uh, how and what came out of this, this, this nostril on the bird, but okay. it, it, may, it may not uh, ever go back to uh, and be symmetrical with the other. Um, although you may get, get a little bit of a remodeling. Wow. And you're saying, I'm saying nares, and you're saying nares. Is it like potato, potato, or am I just mispronouncing? Yes, yes, yes. It's, <laughs> let's it's, just say nostril. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, no, um, it is, it is, Laura. I mean, you know, it, it's, it's good. Just, I'm learning so much every time we do these webinars. Um, so uh, Tamea asks, um, Teflon is bad for birds, but it looks like her, her clothes iron has some nonstick coating and I can even, she can even smell it. Is there any way to have um, a bird safely with that? So we're talking about Teflon that might pop up and other things besides cookware. Yeah, um, <clears throat> what, what uh, in, in general, if you have, have, have issues like that, and this just goes back to your, um, it, within the environment, uh, the, 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 the main thing when you're looking at nonstick or Teflon, or um, I think it's uh, uh, polyethylene, you know, it's it, the PTFE or something like that. Um, the, the main, the main, I guess, issue there is to make sure that if you're using anything like this is that the bird's not within that environment, um, in that room. Uh, and in, in, because it, 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 is, it is very sensitive to that as, as, as the questioner noted. So I, I would say that um, whether the smell's coming from the starch that you're using with the ironing or it's the, the iron itself with the, the surface coating, then I would say just, um, just uh, make sure that the bird is not in the same room. That, that's your, 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 best, your best bet. Now, if, you know, and, and, and with that said, naturally, if the Teflon coated cookware or the nonstick cookware or the, the iron catches on fire and burns and the whole house is engulfed in this, 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 these vapors, then that's not going to be, that's not going to be safe. But under normal usage, as long as the bird isn't in the room, um, you don't, you know, there's nothing to, to be concerned about in my, my, my opinion. Okay. Um, and then we have a question from Gloria, how to treat constricted toe syndrome in an older cockatoo? And what could cause that constricted toe syndrome? Ah, <clears throat> well, um, just uh, treated a little kike, um, uh, I guess, uh, just before Christmas. And uh, yeah, uh, and, and so it's not something we see often. And what happens on the uh, constricted toe syndrome is that, uh, and this usually, and it's, it's interesting that this is an older bird because routinely it happens in young birds. And, and so that is kind of uh, interesting because constricted toe syndrome in an older bird, I would say that that's usually more likely to have some type of a, a uh, foreign body. Uh, and you say a foreign body, a string of hair or something that's wrapped around that toe. Um, that's what I would kind of go 
go toward in an older bird, that there's something wrapped around that toe or that's constricting around that toe, a fiber um, that's, that's causing that toe to appear like it's a, um, a um, uh, uh, that, that, that it has, has, has a constriction uh, on it. So <clears throat> you go like, well, what's, what's constricted toe syndrome? Well, if we, if we draw a, 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 a toe, what, what we're uh, looking at here is that you have an area <clears throat> on the toe, okay, right here uh, as the toe, and you have the claw here, and it, it, it's constricted down. And, and this may be, it may be a little bit more, okay, it doesn't look you you have the constriction, but this is this is much bigger. So this this is much bigger, but you have a stricture right at the the the, the point of the toe. So if you wrapped a string around your finger, mm -hmm. what would happen is that that this would be normal size, and then the end of your finger would get bigger and bigger and bigger. And you're saying, well, how does that occur? How does that occur? Well, what occurs is that what has more pressure, a, an artery or a vein? The artery has more pressure. So the artery can get through this stricture and put the blood in, to circulate. But unfortunately, there's not enough pressure in the vein, venous return to get back through. So blood's continuing to come out, he, out here but it's not getting back, okay? So that's why on a constricted toe syndrome, you have a, the end of the toe looks bigger, okay? On this side of the stricture and the stricture's right here, all right? Now on an older bird, the stricture can be caused by a hair, a oh, piece of fabric. This, this just came in. They said, uh, Gloria had additional information saying that uh, the vet checked and didn't find a string or hair around the toe. Okay, the you know the the issue is is that sometimes it's so fine mm -hmm. that you have to treat. I treat it the same way, and that you don't always find it because it's so tight. Um, but I don't really look for it because I I go ahead and treat the same way whether it's an older bird or a younger bird. And I make I make incisions all the way to the bone. So if you have the bone in here, let's just say you have the bone. You have the bone in here. Then what I'll do is on the top and the bottom, I will cut and make a little incision all the way to the bone. Because I know if I'm making the incision to the bone, that I'm cutting through whatever is causing that stricture to occur. The more severe it is, where the toe almost looks like it is, is falling off, and some of these do self-amputate, then I'll make an incision on the inside, outside, top, and bottom over this stricture so I can ensure that I cut through whatever it is that that's causing. Now, on an older bird, like I said, um, it, 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 that's what it usually is. And I'm not saying it, 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 it is this time because I'm, I'm sure he, you know, the veterinarian, uh, he or she looked at it very well. But for younger birds, it's usually a tissue band that that does not grow uh, with the toe, and and it's it, it's really a physiologic stricture, and so what we have to do is cut through that that to to allow the pressure to you know resolve and you get blood flow, and with a younger bird. 
you have a better chance of, if it's severe, to save the toe. Um, and I never give up on it. You have to bandage it afterwards. I never give up on it. I try to save all of the little toes I can. But, uh, but, but sometimes they'll even present after the toe has, has amputated. But we, we, we bandage the toe afterwards. We bandage the toe and we, uh, we put a little ski on it and we put pressure on this and, and we put some uh, a little antibiotic uh, ointment on there over the, the, the incision marks. But we make the incisions just, just a little bit in front and behind those strictures on top, bottom, and both sides. And, in, in, and even if I don't find any, any foreign body, uh, I just go ahead and, and it, you, you have to break that, that stricture and you have to, to uh, uh, cut it. And sometimes when you go and make your incision to the bone, sometimes that area, whatever's causing it comes out with that little incision. I usually make the incision with uh, 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 needles, uh, you know, just the, the bevel of a needle. That's all I use because many of these are small birds. I'm not talking know. a scalpel, just. Uh... No, no, just the bevel of a needle. So mm -hmm. that would be an outpatient procedure? So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh. Quick. Yeah. Okay. Wow, that's a, it's a little. And, I was and, thinking... and, What's that? I was just imagining, like you know, scalpel and incision. No, no, no. Stitches no, and no. all that. So. Mm -mm. No, uh, we just use a little local anesthetic for the young birds. We don't even want to put them under anesthesia uh, on that. Um, uh, and uh, and so and then there was a question: Is inhalation anesthesia better than the uh, for prolonged surgery than injection? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is by far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, much more control. There, somebody had put that in the yeah. chat. I just said that while, while we were talking about the, the anesthesia aspect. But okay. but we don't, you know, for the small birds, some of these are just, uh, you know, being hand fed like this little kike and, and it was a little white belly and, and uh, it was, uh, and it was pretty bad. But I think, I think it came, I think we saved the toe. I think He's got all, all four toes. But but you're gonna need uh and, and we and sometimes with these you need to have uh you know regular uh every especially the young birds, but uh, other you know you need to have every four or five days if you can send images of how it looks, because we had to reincise that the toe was pretty bad we had to re, re, re incise that two or three times over about a two-week period oh wow yeah okay and i guess they can tolerate that pretty well so it's just a little needle in there yeah 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 it's either that or the toe toe falls off not the whole toe but part of the toe right, cut off. and then if the bone is exposed when the bird grows older you'd want to do a little surgery to put the, make sure that the bone isn't exposed and put the skin over the end of a bone, just like you were amputating part of the toe or the toe got cut or bit off by something like another bird. Which happens. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> well, that was a lot about good, uh, good information about toes and and so yeah. cut off stuff. Um, thank you. <laughs> so I have to announce today's winner. Um, so I didn't say this earlier, but every but this is what we're going to give away to our winner today, who is Frank. By the way, Frank K. Congratulations. So we're going to send you a bag of the Fever uh, Tropical Fruit Pellets, as well as a bag of your bird's choice. So the La Fever office will get a hold of you on, I believe, Monday with the um, get the information from you where to send that out to. So congratulations, Frank K. Thank you for joining us today and. Um, you too can be a, a, a winner of one of our giveaways um, uh, when you tune into the webinar. So next Friday is your next chance. Uh, we have a great webinar, like I mentioned before. We have uh, Dr. Stephanie Lamb. She is going to be covering uh, Love is in the Air. I am, uh, am I sending my parrot the wrong signals? So, you know, February is the month of love. So we have some themed uh, webinars, that being one. And then the week after that, we will be back with Chris Davis with Heart to Heart. So, um, so that's all we have time today for Ask the Vet with Dr. Tolley. Um, 
we will, uh, well, let's see, we'll be coming up again. I'm sure we had a lot, we have so many people that want to pick your brain with their bird's health. So um, we didn't get to all your questions today. Um, we will, we will do our best to get you answers. Um, so. Well, I want to, I want to say, I wanted to say, um, and, and, you know, uh, you, you know, to all of the, the participants that just really thank you for the questions. Thank you for participating and uh, really appreciate it. This is, uh, this is fantastic. And, and the questions were, fan, you know, really, really uh, great uh, today. And, and as they always are. And thank you, Laura, for your, your you know, being the, the, the point person here and, and Brenda uh, too, in the background. Brenda behind the scenes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, it's always it's always a pleasure, um, and I always learn so much, and um, and it's just it's great to, to connect and find out um, how we can make our birds' lives healthier and happier. So, thank you, Dr. Tolley. Um, everybody for joining us. Thank you, and um, uh, till next time. All the best to you and your flock, and take care. Be safe. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye.